Are you looking for a fun way to win up to 25 times your money this football and basketball season? Test your skills on Prize Picks, the most exciting way to play daily fantasy sports. Just select two or more players, pick more or less on their projections for a wide variety of stats, and place your entry. It's as easy as that. If you have the skills, you can turn $10 into $250 with just a few taps. Easy gameplay, quick withdrawals, and injury insurance on your picks are what makes Prize Picks the number one daily fantasy sports app. Ready to test your skills? Join the Prize Picks community of more than 7 million players who have already signed up. Right now, Prize Picks will match your first deposit up to $100. Just visit prizepicks.com slash bluewire and use code bluewire. That's code bluewire at prizepicks.com slash bluewire for a first deposit match of up to $100. Prize Picks, daily fantasy sports made easy. Today's episode is brought to you by cars.com. With over 2 million vehicles and 50,000 more added every day, cars.com will match you with the perfect car for you, your budget, your life, your style. And if you're ready to say goodbye to your current car, cars.com will get you an instant offer to cash it in. Just start by entering your license plate and get matched with a local dealer who will write you the check. So whether you're looking to buy or sell, just go to cars.com. It's magical. This call is being recorded. Hello, everybody. It's Kirk Henderson. I'm back tonight with Jeffrey Cooperstein, and we're having a great evening because the Mavericks just won 118 to 97. Now, guys, I'm back from vacation. Josh has been doing this because I was traveling across the country, but uh, the Mavericks are basically must see TV for me. So, even though I just got back, I hopped on and watched this game. Let me tell you, it was an outstanding game. Uh, but uh, before I give my take on things, I want to punt immediately to Coop. So, what what did what did you think about the game tonight? Yeah, it was it was a really good game. Uh, they both teams started out slow on the offensive end, and then the Mavericks really picked it up. I think the difference in the game that really settled the Mavericks down was bringing JJ Barea in uh, in the second quarter, and I thought that really got the Mavericks into a rhythm and. The bench was great tonight. I mean, we'll we'll get into it later, but it it afforded the Mavericks to rest their starters in the fourth quarter. And now you might be in a situation where Porzingis might even be able to play tomorrow on the back to back. Um, so a really good Ooh, bench that's effort. Interesting. Really good team effort, and obviously, uh, Luca was ridiculous again. That's a great take. I had not even considered the fact that Porzingis might be able to play tomorrow because you know the Mavericks have been very vocal about the fact that they want to. They want to rest Porzingis on on the you know at least one game of the back to back, and the fact that he he only played eighteen minutes tonight because of foul trouble and you know just relative ineffectiveness on the on the offensive end. Um, but that's really interesting. Okay, I hadn't thought of that. Did, so I'm I'm looking at the box score. Let's let's continue to focus on the bench before we circle back around to Luca. Um, Seth Curry was a hysterical plus thirty two. <laughs> oh, it, he was. I mean, Seth. This is. This is Seth's best game I've ever seen him play. And obviously, I didn't watch him much last year when he was in Portland. But, I mean, he had everything going tonight. He was making his shots. He was he was creating. He was the point guard there in the fourth quarter. So, he was initiating offense. This is the best game I've seen him play. I was really interested in that, too. And, you know, I'm not sure if you've seen this today, but Jonathan Sharks of the Ringer, formerly of MavsMoneyBall.com, wrote an article today that, that's titled How the Mavericks Unlock Luka Doncic's MVP Potential. And one of the things that he talked about was basically how the Mavericks are only pairing Luka with guys who don't need the ball. Uh, everybody else has kind of been relegated to either bench duty or relegated to cut minutes. I'm a little curious where Seth fits in that because I think he, you know, I envision him as an off ball player, but I really still think he has these point guard instincts. Uh, you know, he likes the dribble. He's got, he's a pretty good decision maker. So I'm going to be interested to see where, you know, they, 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 they go with his minutes because, you know, we have uh, uh, Brunson here who only played five minutes tonight, which is really, you know, his, his minutes seem to be declining over the last several games. But, you know, with the way the bench is structured, the Mavericks seem to need different guys on different nights based on matchups. And, and that's been really kind of an asset for them over the last several games. Yeah, absolutely. And, um, you know, it's it's good to have that because they do have guys that they can play based on matchups. Uh, if you're playing a team with a big guy, you can rotate in Boban for 10, 15 minutes. Um, as we saw we saw earlier, and this might have been just a case of wanting to get guys rest, but we saw little Jackson at the five in the fourth quarter. That the was Mavericks fun. Have, yeah, that was, that was awesome to see. The Mavericks have options as far as their bench goes. 
And we saw that again tonight with Berea getting into the getting into the mix. Everyone just has to stay ready. Uh, Brunson only played five minutes tonight, but who knows? He can play twenty minutes tomorrow night. It's 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 people don't have a set role on the Mavericks bench right now, and I think it's actually working to their uh, to their benefit. I kind of like it in in terms of the bench because I feel like that you know it, it's it's like the phrase always leave them wanting more and I really feel like that's where the bench is at this point in time because I'm looking at the, the lineup and you know we have a lot of of longtime Mavs fans who wonder why Berea isn't playing more and I gotta say I feel like when they use him sparsely he's a lot more effective because frankly he's a little bit of a surprise and so if you have three different lead guards Brunson right Berea and to maybe to a lesser extent Curry who can hop off the bench be able to dribble the ball make some shots and do some things that's really going to be an effective you know uh uh strategy as as teams become better at scouting as you go on and so you know the Mavericks bench I think they scored you know over 50 points tonight which is that's just an incredible contribution and the sort of thing the Mavericks are going to need as they as they dip into this you know uh second uh quarter of the schedule as they start to play harder teams yeah the the variety is super important and I think you hit it right on the head JJ is a surprise to a lot of teams because he's not necessarily in the rotation but JJ doesn't need to play consistent minutes in order to go out there and make an impact as we saw tonight you can Mm -hmm. you can throw him out there and he's he's the ultimate guy that if a game's getting super wild Rick's gonna go to JJ and the game will settle down because that's just what JJ does and you know he's he's what I like to call the Luca whisperer because I think he, uh, I think he helps Luca out a lot with without playing. He sees stuff Luca doesn't see, and they're able to talk to each other. And I think Luca really, really uh, respects JJ's opinion on things. And so, there's no doubt in my mind that when JJ signed that deal, that even if he wasn't playing a lot, that he would have a big role on the team. Mm-hmm. He made one absurd wraparound bounce pass to right that resulted yeah. in a dunk. And it's plays like that that I'm reminded of how effective he is, regardless of how I may feel about his playing time. When he does things like that, they get because there, there's just a uh, an expanding effect on the team when things like that happen. Because the Mavericks bench really, really got them on the roll. Okay, I think we we have to pivot to to you know the man we talk about every night, Luka Doncic, who finished with a absolutely banana stat line, and on a day where he was awarded the Western Conference Player of the Month, the youngest ever player to do so, the fifth ever Maverick to do so. He put up 33 points, a whopping 18 rebounds, and five assists. Tell me what you thought about his game. I mean, dude, he does it every night. It's ridiculous. Every single night, he's going out there, he's getting 30. I didn't see the 18 rebounds coming, especially in only three quarters he had 18 rebounds. Uh, even he said on the post game show with Kurt, with, uh, not in his post game interview with Kirsten Ludlow that he was just under the basket and the ball was just coming to him. I mean that's how you get eighteen rebounds, especially at his size. And I mean he just he does it every night. He's the best player on the floor every night, and that includes when they were playing LeBron James and Anthony mm-hmm. Davis. He was the best player on the court. Um, nothing surprises me anymore. I the only thing that disappointed me about tonight was that the Pelicans couldn't keep it close enough, so he couldn't keep his absurd streak of what was 22 points and six rebounds six assists games going oh that's right i read about that today in one of the press releases i didn't even know that was a thing yeah he only only had five assists tonight and because he didn't play the fourth quarter so you can thank the pelicans for that yeah the mavericks missed a lot of gimmies that were that were like right to them open shots you know Porzingis missed one at the rim that he put back but you know what's fun about games like tonight is is mid game I just kind of started playing around with with basketball reference and I, I I looked at all available data uh going back to 1983-84 with the with the uh the game logs and on basketball reference players to have at least 33 points 18 rebounds and 5 assists there have only been 40 four games ever where that was done um Dirk actually had one way back in uh in in 2002 of all things uh Luca did it in 28 minutes which is basically the fastest ever there if if you look up the stat lines there's some the, the funny part about that is you start discovering like some really actually crazy stat lines I laughed out loud when I saw the the number one like the best possible game with those minimums do you want to guess who had it I it was Jordan I saw your tweet 
69 points, 18 rebounds, six assists, and four steals. That is, I can't even fathom a game like that, but alas, nice. it happened in 1990 when I was six. Anyways, don't want to make this a Jordan podcast, but it was just outstanding watching Luca, you know, kind of control the game. And it's really incredible when you when you watch him and you feel like that there are things that are left out on the floor where he has an absolutely dominating game. And you still see little things where he can improve, where his teammates can improve. I don't think this Maverick offense is anywhere near its ceiling. No, no, it's it's not a finished product by any means. I mean, we're only a quarter into the season here, and they really haven't even figured out how Luca and Porzingis are going to play off each other yet. So there's the, there's a whole element of of this offense that hasn't even they haven't even introduced it yet into games, and it's. It'll be really scary if if they can ever figure that out. Well, right now, they're a Western Conference best 8.6 point differential with with these games. And, you know, people are probably wondering who haven't, you know, who are kind of tuning back in on the Mavs or don't follow the advanced stats. Point differential is an incredibly important stat in terms of really figuring out which teams are good versus which teams are lucky. And the Mavericks absolutely beating the pants off of some of these, you know, middling to lesser teams is extremely important because it means they're not playing down to their to their opponents. And that's something that, you know, uh, I was talking to Dalton Trigg of DallasBasketball.com tonight, and he just said, man, isn't this nice? And and what he was referencing was the fact that, you know, we're no longer really, and, and they're probably going to be games like this, but I feel like it's been a while where the Mavericks have been in one of those positions where we're like, ah, oh, crap, they're letting a team back in it again. They're beating who they're supposed to beat, and that's really cool. Yeah, it hasn't been like this in a long time, and obviously this is the best team they've had in a, in a while, in at least three years. But, it, yeah, I mean, they're they're playing really well against really good teams, uh, as, with the exception of the Clippers game, and they're beating the crap out of teams like Golden State and like Cleveland and like New Orleans tonight, who they should beat. And mm-hmm. that, you know, that's an ultimate indicator of a good team if you're playing how you're supposed to against the respective competition. Well, let's pivot to anything we were a little disappointed in. It's hard to be too disappointed in a game that has a double-digit margin of victory. But uh, do you have anything? Uh, I was, you know, obviously the poor thing is thing stands out a little bit. He was, he, they kept force-feeding him in the post, and he just wasn't making those shots. And I understand from the Mavericks standpoint that they want to get him those shots because they feel like he could be super effective there. But the fact of the matter is that he's not right now. And if it's not working, they, they need to go away from it and try to work on it and practice or work on it elsewhere instead of the game. Um, and then when he feels more comfortable with it, then you can implement it back in. But right now that's just not working for them. And Porzingis was great on defense. He impacted yes. a lot of shots. What I believe, I think he had five blocks tonight, four in the first quarter. Um, so it's not like he, it's not like he's not having an impact whatsoever, but I, th- I think they need to get that figured out. It's really strange because, you know, there's a marketing effect with players like Porzingis who spend their time in a huge market like New York, because he was sold to the public as kind of a Dirk heir parent and, you know, not to be disrespectful to Porzingis, who has been better than I thought he would be, if I'm really honest. He's more impactful on the defensive end. His his uh, ability to shoot threes is really an unheralded part of why Luka is so amazing at getting to the rim because he's creating space. But the ability to post up and do these sorts of things, he's not good at it right now. I'm not really sure he was ever good at it, but right now he's atrocious. Uh, heading into the game, he shot 32% on post-ups and turned the ball over 10% of the time. That's not something that, you know, you can do at the volume that they did tonight and really expect to be good on offense. Now, the fact that he's been that terrible and that they still have a, a really incredible offense speaks to how good everything else is working out. But he's, you know, Josh and I have talked about this at length. You know, when he cuts, when they get him coming off of, you know, up, uh, down screens, and then anything on a side pick and roll towards the basket, he's incredible. And I'm not particularly sure why they feel the need to isolate him on these smaller players because he's so tall, his center of gravity gets knocked off by just about everyone. Yeah, and I I think he needs, he's not, I don't know if he knows how to play against uh, smaller 
smaller people defending him. And the problem with that is that, especially with his back to the basket, everyone's going to be smaller than him. I just think mm-hmm. they, they disrupt him in a way that he hasn't really figured out how to counter yet. Um, it's still early in the season. And obviously with him just coming back and whatnot, it's going to take him some time to adjust. But yeah, like you said, I mean, the the offense works so well, even w- with him being so bad that if they were ever to, uh, not bad overall, bad in the post, if they were mm-hmm. ever to figure this out, it would it would make them probably the deadliest offense in the league. Easily. And, and as a... As a retired post player, if I could make a suggestion to Porzingis, it's that when he faces up, he makes a decision on the face up. Because what I am getting kind of worn out by is the face up, examine, and then makes a move. If he's going to shoot over a guy, shoot over a guy. But he really, it looks like he's reading the floor, but I don't know why, because he never passes out of the post up. Um, it, it, that, you know, he's actually pretty good when he makes a power dribble towards the basket and, you know, because his, his length is so, is, is so hard to manage that even if he uses the left hand, if he just takes one, you know, decisive dribble, I think that's going to throw the defense off balance. I think he could get some foul calls that way because it's going to force a reach. I know that's, that's, that's a little, you know, it's me being, you know, uh, channeling some, some old basketball thoughts, but I just, you know, I've seen him do it enough times when he goes, you know, he makes a decisive move at the rim where I just, I'd like to see more of it is all. Yeah. Yeah. He, he, he does need to be more decisive on the offensive end and that'll come with time. And especially he's it, I'm not worried about it. It's just a little frustrating to see in the moment that the way his inconsistency right now, um, but it's going to get better and it's just going to take time. And I think that we have the best coaches in the league. I, I say we like I'm an employee of the team. I hate when people do that. The Mavericks have some of the best coaches in the league and uh, they'll be, they'll be able to figure it out and they'll figure out what works for him and what doesn't. And uh, they'll get this thing rolling. Yeah. I'm I'm having a real good time with this. So we come back uh tomorrow night we should be here you're gonna have to be at the game am i right yes i will be at the game probably doing working things so yeah yeah they play the timberwolves for the first time tomorrow night at uh 7 30 local time it's uh, you know watching how dallas plays in the back-to-back and against the team who's in the kind of middle of the pack in the west that should be really interesting because this is another one of their many challenging matchups in december and if they can string together a a you know essentially a winning streak where they they uh, playing against the wolves would give them you know uh, four straight wins it would be geez they've they've had a heck of a streak since they lost to the Knicks and the Celtics you know they've only had one one loss since then to the Clippers this would yep. be this would be pretty incredible I'm really looking forward to tomorrow night's game yeah and if if Porzingis plays I would love to see the Carl Anthony Towns versus Porzingis matchup I think that's a That'd be a really fun thing to see, but I don't know if they'll keep him out or not. I think he only played 17 minutes tonight, so I think it wouldn't hurt him too bad if they if they played tomorrow, but we'll see what happens. God, that's a great take. I, I'm annoyed I didn't even think of it. All right, everybody, we've had fun as usual. Uh, rate and subscribe. Tell your friends. We're having a really good time doing these, and I think you know you guys are as well because with each game, we're seeing more and more people tune in and listen to us. And, you know, uh, it's it's obviously feedback from, from our uh, listeners is welcome. And this has been Kirk and Coop talking at Mavs Moneyball After Dark. Everybody have a good day.